exciting time to be in Washington and happy to talk about it a little bit, tell you I know what's going on. I know a lot of us, and I have some, a lot of people in the room are very excited when we got results in last November's election. Our wonderful Ron Johnson coming back from the United States, uh, from the United States Senate, as well as Donald Trump being elected president, and the guy who you know, was sworn any more than any president in his memory at a, uh, a, a pro business, pro manufacturing stance. And I'm not over the things that we've done so far. The things Every day we get more news, I guess. Uh, just yesterday, the day before, we had a, uh, another person approved uh, to, the Naval, to the National Labor Relations Board. And that's going to affect a lot of people in the regard to the joint assembly, the joint rule, the joint, uh, joint assembly uh, rule there uh, with regard to franchises and that sort of thing. So now we have four of the five people on the uh, National Labor Relations Board. As soon as we get the fifth person confirmed, which hopefully There is somewhat of a perception we're not doing it. And actually, as far as just buying this stuff, it's been a long time since the Congress was so productive. Um, the, uh, the House itself, in Trump's first 100 days, passed 158 bills. We had 35 bills signed into law. And at least that's more activity that you've seen in Congress in the first year of a president, at least before H.W. Bush. So as far as pure volume, we've been doing a lot. Um, not, I'll, I'll deal with the things we haven't gotten done yet, um, but we, we passed out a bill on career and technical education, which is something we've been waiting for a long time. I know in this state, we have such a labor shortage, particularly in uh, regard to manufacturing jobs around here. So we're giving local units of government more flexibility in how they can use federal money to make sure that we uh, we are able to apply the money in places in which people can't get jobs and which industry needs people. Of course, that's a, I think when you, when you look at your business climate, you look at three things. So it's your regulatory environment, you look at your labor uh, force situation, you your taxation. And I'm, I'm hoping to get that bill through the Senate as well. We had passed it last year, the Senate did not take it out of time, uh, but that would be a good step in the right direction as far as dealing with our labor shortage. We dealt with several bills on sex trafficking. Now that's a big thing around here. The nation has a bigger problem than it used to be. Both of those bills are passing on a bipartisan basis. You know, you got this perception of have so many people say, why aren't Republicans and Democrats, why aren't Republicans and Democrats are working together? Uh, we pass a lot of bills all the time. You know, I'm very well personally, I think. Um, there's certain bills that we're going to have problems with. Got the Democrats on board there. We had uh, Donald Trump sign a nice bill with regard to VA reform. Um, among other things, we're going to be able to remove bad employees from the VA. That was something that's always, you know, always frustrates people in government. You have uh, bad employees, you can't get rid of them. And when I was in the state legislature for years, I tried to make an issue to remove a bad teacher, which is hurting our schools. I could never get those bills through. Finally, Scott Walker came along, cared enough about education. Uh, we got that done. Uh, and finally, with Donald Trump here, it's a bill that hadn't moved under Barack Obama, but under Donald Trump, we finally are getting a little more VA reform, which I think is a good thing that's done. Uh, we are working on our budget right now. Well, well, let me deal with the things that we so far haven't gotten done. But like I said, I do want to emphasize just this sheer volume of bills gotten out. We're moving kind of an unprecedented rate. Um, I will talk a little bit about the Obamacare repeal and the difficulty in getting it done and where I think it's going to go. Um, people said, why didn't the Republicans have a plan before? And we did have a plan. Paul Ryan had a plan called the Better Way to Health Care Reform. It's something a lot of Republicans referred to. And they ran for office last time. But in order to pass the bill, you need 218 votes in the House and at least 50 votes in the Senate. And that can be a little bit more of a difficult thing to do because even though a lot of Republicans are on board, you can be 50 out of 52 Republicans. The problem they have is as follows. A lot of Republicans want to get rid of the additional taxes that were used to fund Obamacare. They don't like Obamacare, and they want government out of health care altogether. And I will agree that if the government hadn't been involved with so much in health care in the first place, overall health care costs would be lower, uh, just as things in which government 
is not involved in things like cosmetic surgery. The cost has fallen over time. I would argue because the government hasn't been involved in it. I think that the cost of other things would have, would have fallen in line. But unfortunately, the government is very involved in health care. And uh, I think some of the Republicans who want government out altogether, um, and we're holding out for that, are not going to get it their way. On the other hand, you have a lot of people who are not as many as you think, but some people who are dependent right now on Obamacare. And those people are, are getting a benefit. As we take money out of the system and repeal the taxes, their benefits is going to be less. We are giving them some benefits under both plans that I voted for. But if you look at two groups of people, people who want to make sure that, say, the 58-year-old single person has benefits, and I, I we certainly want to make sure they have health insurance, and those people want the government out altogether, you have two kind of diametrically opposed positions. When you try to get 50 out of 52 Republicans on board in the Senate, that makes things difficult. I personally am not certain that some of Republican leadership want to repeal Obamacare. I say it for this reason. I happen to be on the floor of the state senate, which is kind of well known, and I, that uh, John McCain said he was going to vote for the bill, and then changed his mind and decided to vote against it. And Mitch McConnell, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, gave a long speech about how disappointing he was and how it worked so hard, and, uh, but now it's time. John McCain voted no on that bill. He didn't vote against the bill per se. He voted on process. We should have more committee hearings. We should have more reports uh, before he voted on that bill. And it seems to me if Mitch McConnell really wanted that bill to pass, he would have had the committee hearings and got the reports and brought back the vote. You know, six weeks later, John McCain would have voted yes. We would have wound up negotiating between the House and the Senate. The fact that he didn't do that on a personal level makes me kind of wonder. You know, did he really not want it, want to have to deal with this? And do you want Obamacare to continue? In any event, the Obamacare exchanges are falling apart. Um, a substantial number of counties in Wisconsin is only going to have one provider next year. In Iowa, something like 90 out of 94 counties, something like that, will have no provider at all under Obamacare, which means that uh, we'll have a real messy year. And I think for that reason, something will have to be done. I hate to predict, but you've seen in the paper that um, Patty Murray of Washington and Lamar Alexander of Tennessee are working on something. I wouldn't be surprised if they come through with something patching together Obamacare for one or two more years until they can work on something. If I had a criticism of the plan that came out of the House, I don't think they did enough to focus on the cost they just focused on who's going to pay for it. Well, I don't care whether you're the government or whether you're a, a business trying to provide health care for your employees, whether you're just an individual looking to buy health insurance on the market. The problem is cost. Okay. And I think right now the insurance system sometimes encourages people to go to the doctor and have things done that are not necessarily necessary. Aren't necessary. I think that if you talk to people, honest people in the medical system, and I, I'm having my Sheboygan day, by the way. So I started out the statewide realtors over at Blue Harbor today, so I talked to them. Then I talked to hospital administrators all over, uh, all over the district. Uh, uh, I had Aurora here in town. Uh, I'm going to guys, and I'm going to go to the, uh, talk to the Sheboygan County credit union folks and uh, wrap it up by touring the hospital. So, um, but as many people in the medical system acknowledge, sometimes we do things that aren't absolutely necessary. Uh, the results in the more available, the more uh, revenue coming in. And the goal has to be to address that. A lot of times, larger businesses are addressing it through things like employer based clinics. They self insure, uh, they get involved a little bit in wellness, they have their employees by cost of health which hospital is the best, which hospital charges more, that sort of thing. Somehow the government has to make that more universal. And the goal has to be by making that universal, the cost of everything begins to fall and makes the answers easier. Right? I'm disappointed that that wasn't done the first time around. It seems to me the first of the bills that we voted on, like I said, I voted on a couple myself, because everything's better than what we have right now. It will be better than what we have right now. Um, but 
it seems too often it was done just to get to the mandatory 18 months. You sit at a table and say, what do you want, what do you want, what do you want, okay, that's the plan. Rather than have people understood the medical system get together, find a good plan, and sell it to the Congress and sell it to the senators. Hopefully now they're taking a break and have people doing that. I will volunteer to be one of those people and not want to become one of the right. health care committees, so I probably won't be on the inside of it, but I will be very vocal. Next time we go to so I can ask you what's going to cost. Um, that's not what's going on with regard to the Obamacare. Next thing I'll deal with is taxes. Um, we have tax reduction reform in this country because right now we're just losing business. We have two big problems. Our corporate income tax is the highest in the industrialized world. Um, everybody agrees that that's got to be. Um, we are broke out of our mind. We are $20 trillion in debt. I think the average man and woman child in this country is $60,000 in debt. I believe it. I that. They only afford $240,000 in debt. Nevertheless, I am convinced we are losing businesses in this country by having a high tax rate. Um, and we also, because of our high ta tax rate, have something called the repatriation tax, in which you are one of these big multinational corporations. If you are earning money abroad or even in Puerto Rico, um, if you bring that money back to the United States to invest, you're going to pay the proper tax on that. So if you're a big company and you're sitting on whatever, $400 billion in Puerto Rico, and you have to decide whether you're going to bring it back and invest it in some good facilities in the United States, or whether you're going to keep it down there and invest it in bonds or whatever. Right now, there's a strong incentive to keep that money growing. We've got to change that, that incentive. So those are two things that have to be done. Um, the more difficult thing is what the tax code will look like when they are done. One of the reasons many things don't get done so you understand is unlike any other body I've ever heard of, be it the school board or the county board or the state legislature, for not everything, but for most things to pass the U.S. Senate, it requires 60 months. So people think the Republicans are in charge. Why don't they just shut these things through? For most things, it takes eight Democrats in the U.S. Senate to get something done. And that complicates the issue overwhelmingly. Well, occasionally, some of the Democrats will vote with the Republicans. To get eight Democrats, it pretty much means you need the blessing of Chuck Schumer, who is the Senate Minority Leader. And that slows down a lot of things. It's one of the reasons why you have to do a lot of things. I am working directly with the EPA on that, but it nice if we could just pass the bill and we should play them off the hook, given that so far as you have pollution, pollution didn't even originate here. Um, but it would take 60 votes in the Senate. Sadly, there are enough, I don't want to say extreme because some of my friends, but um, people are not willing to compromise on environmental issues uh, in the Democratic Party. Um, so, in order to get tax reform, we have to get it through a process called reconciliation, which I didn't know about until I got to Congress. And that means that, first of all, the House and Senate have to pass a budget saying that we're going to be able to deal with tax reform with 50 votes, 51 votes, in the U.S. Senate. And I'll come around to the budget in a second, but when we get there, there are two types of tax reform. You could either change taxes for 10 years and then go back to what they are today. And if you think back when George Bush was president and had his tax cuts, his tax cuts expired after 10 years. Remember that? And at the time, just sitting back here in Wisconsin, I thought, that was dumb. Why did the Bush people not make the tax cuts permanent? Why would you ever you know, change the tax law and make it good for only 10 years? The reason is, under the rules of the Senate, if you want a tax cut with 51 it can only be for 10 years. If you want a change in the tax code to be permanent, uh, it has to be what they call revenue neutral. Not really a tax cut. You have some tax increases, some tax decreases. You can simplify, but you can't overall cut taxes. Um, right now, there are two proposals out there, both of which have their own flaws. One is a Trump proposal. One is a congressional proposal that some people are referring to the Paul Ryan proposal. I don't know if that's fair or not, but it's sort of proposal. The House Ways and Means Committee is what it is. Um, 
I think in both cases, my concern is we want to focus somewhat on the middle class. I think in our society, um, the, the very, very wealthy um, are very, very wealthy. And can look out um, in Congress. And sometimes politicians like to fall over themselves to help the poor, or in some cases, people who um, are not working as hard as they could be working. And as a result, the middle class don't get the benefit they should. Um, that is a concern I have. Uh, another concern I have is they are working towards things in the House plan that I think some think tank people like, but don't, don't make any common sense. I'll give you an example of that. They are talking right now about 100% expensing on real estate. Okay, now I assume we have a couple of landlords out here. And if they don't, um, what it would mean is, if you buy, say, a, a four-family for $200,000, you would immediately get a $200,000 deduction. Okay, that's not reflective of what goes on in the real world, because right if you buy an apartment you really haven't had lost, that apartment is still worth $200,000. But there's some people who feel that would encourage people to build more apartments if you've got a $200,000 loss that they built it. The same people want to get rid of the mortgage deduction, rental property and the deduction for property taxes on the property. Now right now, if you go on rental properties and they used to do with taxes, you kind of look at that return and you still visualize the rents being the income. You get deductions on depreciation, you get deduction for mortgage interest and deduction for property taxes. Well, after they're done with this, after you get the big deduction the first year, you've got rental income coming in, but no depreciation or property tax or mortgage interest offset it which is goofy. If you stuck with me, congratulations, but it's goofy. It means your, it means your tax revenue has nothing whatever to do with your, uh, your actual revenue. I think it creates a, an incentive for people to build apartments for no particular purpose. I, I was doing income tax in the 1980s when we used to have see-through, sky-rise in places like Denver and Texas. And reason you built, at the time you built um, skyscrapers without any tenants because it made tax sense. And I can see us marching towards that again. So that's one concern that I have. And like I said, the other concern that I have is I want to make sure we, we get the middle class gets their fair share of the tax cut. And I'm not sure of either proposal that is true right now, though Donald Trump did say last week that he wanted to make sure that the income tax that's what somebody's getting to. I talked to the staff, I don't know what happened, I talked to the staff, and I said, I have something to do with that, at least somebody pointed that out to me. So that's what's going on with the taxes. I assume we'll pass a budget, and I assume some sort of tax reform will happen by the end of the year. It should, because it should be relatively easy. Um, I ran on welfare reform, because I do believe right now our welfare system sadly discourages people from working and certainly discourages people from getting married. I think both of those things ought to change. I am trying to get um, provisions in the current budget that will cause us to take that up. I'm not sure I'm getting the enthusiasm I want from other Republicans, but it should be something to just take care of. I'm sure the public is overwhelmed with us on that. The budget itself, I think right now, could be described from my perspective as a little bit too free spending. Uh, Donald Trump, because our military, no one in the military, uh, they have shortages, uh, particularly of spare parts and things, so we do have to give them more money. Donald Trump is prepared to give them a five and a half percent increase. I, I think when you are as broke as we are and you're borrowing 13 percent of your budget, five and a half percent is, is good. Uh, at least um, General Mattis felt that would be adequate. We had some other uh, Armed Services come before the Budget Committee they felt was adequate. A lot of Republicans, though, weighed in with leadership and said they wanted to increase over 11%, which is a substantial increase when you grow. Um, it looks like Republican leadership is settling in and saying that 9.5 is okay. And to me, I don't think 9.5 is okay, so I'll see what I can do about shaving a little bit off of there. Donald Trump was prepared to give a 5.5% increase because he was prepared to say that you cut non defense what they call discretionary spending by 7 to 8%. Congress is saying they're only going to cut it by about 1.2%. So you have a situation where both military and non-military 
Congress is substantially above what Donald Trump wanted. I don't think there's been enough press on that topic, and I think I'd be winning the fights up there if the press was rallying people up and saying, oh, no, Congress doesn't give up a program for Donald Trump who's trying to rein in spending. Um, it's not like I agree with all of Donald Trump's cuts, but I think we could have gotten more than 1% the cut there, and I'm going to keep fighting for that. But that is a place in which the Republican Congress and Donald Trump disagree. And one of which clearly Donald Trump, I think, is behaving. His budget did have cuts on things I don't think they should have cut, but I'll tell you, he gets that we're spending too much money. I don't think Congress is there yet. We don't have the sense of urgency we should in Congress. Okay, there's the budget. There's the taxes. There's the Obamacare. Um, we'll, oh, good news today, because um, I know him a little bit. Michael Brennan was nominated by uh, Donald Trump to be on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, which is good news, a good guy, another another good judge we're going to hand, which makes me feel good. Um, with regard to the ozone problems in the EPA, uh, I have been involved with the EPA and expect to see some aggressiveness there that we haven't had in the past. Um, one of the things I'm focusing on is where they're going to measure ozone in Sheboygan County. And so you understand, first of all, the air is so much cleaner than when I was a child. When I was a child, they were talking about this huge threat from ozone. So it's way cleaner. Uh, and then, largely insofar as Sheboygan has an ozone problem, it's caused by pollutants coming up from south of here. So it seems a little unfair to crack down again and again on, on Sheboygan businesses, as well as the irritating uh, emissions tests. You know what I'm talking about? They always talk about the effect on attainment has on, on, on manufacturers, which is true. But I'll tell you, you know, when you have an old beater car and you like to run your car to the end, you got to a thousand bucks for a catalytic converter. Isn't that irritating? Is that right? And it's, it's really kind of anti-poor. Do you ever think about that? For all the uh, all liberals that push that, if I'm some poor guy, can only afford a 15-year-old car, and then the government tells me to keep running my car, I have to put $1,500 in it. In any event, a lot of these pollutants are coming from around here, and when they measure whether or not Sheboygan does not attain them, they put the monitors right on the machine. And for whatever reason, you always get higher, higher um, ozone readings right along the lake. And if you put the monitor in the middle of the county, say in Plymouth, where it should be, and then, then you'd be in attainment. But they put them right, I know in Ozaki County, they put it, what's the park right uh, east? Harrington. They put it right on uh, where Harrington Beach goes out in, in Lake Michigan. They put the monitor way out there on the lake to make sure that they get a bad. And I'm going to work on where they put the monitors. Of course, nobody lives directly in the lake. That's right. So why are we measuring? <laughs> Just because they like to flaunt people. It'd be like a like a high school teacher giving an unnecessarily strict test. Just because they like to have kids there, right? Um, but I'm going to work on where they put the monitors and see what I can do there. So that, in general, is what's going on. Um, I do continue, like I said, look out for manufacturing. When we do the tax, uh, the tax reform, right now, manufacturers and construction and agriculture get a special credit, um, which does help them a little. A lot of times in an effort to simplify things, they're willing to get rid of that credit. I have no problem with benefiting manufacturing. Um, to me, manufacturing is what makes you wealthy. And everybody else goes up as long as you're making stuff and if you're not making stuff. Everybody else goes on. So I tell the manufacturers, don't give up, don't give up that credit without getting something back. Because if you give up the credit, it's gone for good. Um, I have always believed strongly in manufacturing, good in my state senate life, but right now, this district that I have with 435 congressmen has more manufacturing jobs than anywhere else in the country, which is kind of amazing. By the way. That's something we should we should know. Not my, not my district has the most, which it does. But Wisconsin, collectively, of the 50 states, has the second highest percentage of employees in manufacturing. Just kind of neat. I didn't used to know that. You know, you grow up here, they talk about cheese ads, da da da, and you think, yeah, we got all the corn farms around here. You don't realize that manufacturing, the only state with more is Indiana, and it's really close, and there's a drop way into Michigan. So, uh, 
big stuff for Wisconsin, so it's good that they have me because I'm all pro manufacturing. Manufacturing is so important in this area. Um, but that's kind of it. Um, I should look at the time. How long are we going to have? Can we go? We'll take a couple of questions. See what else I can tell you. Um, Donald Trump, people ask me about Donald Trump. Um, I think he shouldn't tweet so much. <laughs> When I get around the district on weekends and I come back every weekend, I always to get people going talking about what's going on in Washington. Because people always say, Glenn, what do people want to talk to you about? And really, when I get around to my festivals or parades or whatever, people basically want to talk about, you know, how's the weather or something like that. They don't want to talk about what I do in Washington. So to get them going, I always say, if I see Donald Trump for two minutes this week, what should I tell them? I have eighty percent of the time is telling them to tweet something. A lot of people around are saying, keep going, he's doing the right thing. And when I did meet him, that's what I told him. Hopefully, I appreciate it. I got like one minute with him. I'm still hoping to get 15 minutes or a half hour with him during that one minute. I use that. But um, he clearly loves people. I mean, if you see him in one of these rallies, he would just, he would do the rope line all week if he could shake people's hands and have his picture taken with him. It was like this good thing. Um, during the campaign, I got to meet times in Eau Claire and in Green Bay. And it was kind of different than what I thought in that he spent so much of the time asking me what he ought to do, which I thought was kind of a cool trick, you know. But well, where should I go next time I'm in Wisconsin? What should I do in Wisconsin? Which is, which is kind of a cool thing. And um, so that's that's what I know about him. And he uh, he is much more hands-on with the Congress than Barack Obama. Um, he during the Obamacare stuff and voted out of the house he would call congressmen, you know, eight, eight or nine o'clock at night and ask them for their vote, which I think is kind of, what do you think that the president always saying or congressman was like, oh, who's that? Hello, it's Donald Trump. But, um, and I, I will believe that because once during the campaign, one of my endorsement, I was driving the car and picked up the phone, and I could drive the car, the phone rings, it's Donald Trump. Yeah, I'll move yes. So, I, so I, I believe that's what he's doing there, which is, I think, like I said, apparently Barack Obama was much more like your hand and staff handle it. And Donald Trump is not afraid to have people up to the White House. So there's my comments on it. Now, I should, I should ask questions. What is a question? Do everybody want to raise their hand and ask a question? Yes. Um, I'm just, I'm just a comment. Do you hear uh, your opinions on, uh, you know, as you practically said, we've got a worker shortage. Uh, and then, against that, we've got sort of the immigration reform and, and obviously a lot of issues on security and all that, but at the same time, some of the rhetoric seems to be affecting the ability to work as well. Well, on immigration, it seems to be obvious. We do need workers, right? In part because there are jobs a lot of people want to do, but even jobs people want to do, there are labor shortages. I mean, if I, if I went through all the industrial parks like around here, I bet 90% of the employers would say we can't. Um, I hope we have the ability to pass immigration reform. Um, but when we do it, part of it has to be we've got to stop having people come here illegally. I mean, there are, I'm sure, many wonderful people who are illegal immigrants who are working here. But why shouldn't they all move? Right? And if you talk to some of the people in social services, some people taking advantage of our benefits are. Immigrants. Why would we, under any circumstances, take somebody here to go on the welfare? Um, there are people coming here who are taking advantage of our medical system, show up in the emergency room. And given the out of control cost we have on health care, it's expensive enough to provide health care for our own people, we're providing health care for the world. Um, talk to some of the prison guards at Oxford Federal Prison. I mean, they see you know, some illegals in the prison system, which we should have. So I think the important thing is to make sure in the future we are taking the best. Because we are the best and the whole world wants to, not the whole world, but a lot of the world wants to come here. And we should have no problem making sure that the people who come here are going to be people, every one of which is adding to society. At least when I was a child growing up, you would hear that the first generation, uh, you know, the children of the immigrants earn more than the native born which is because they came here with that special immigrant drive, they came here wanting to figure out why, and 
really add a lot to our economy. And that should be the goal we have. And for whatever reason, we have largely nowhere near enforced our borders like we should have for like the last 30 years. And that's why we're in a mess in the first place. And it's because a lot of politicians, whatever they say, apparently like the idea of picking our immigrants by whoever wants to break the law. That's not a good way to pick your immigrants. Oh, somebody's got to be thinking something. You turn on the news every night, you're yelling at the TV, that's stupid or enough. <laughs> Any thoughts on the um, left? Yeah, I, I like Reince, and I'm sure he's going to wind up on his feet because he's so hardworking and has such great organizational skills. Um, I think General Kelly, uh, further, furthermore, I'm really glad that Scaramucci is out, because he's not who we needed. And I think, I think General Kelly, given his background, you can't help but be a little bit in awe of him. Can you? And I think, um, insofar as one of the jobs of the chief of staff is to kind of rein in some of the tweets a little, I think General Kelly, as much as I love rights, and I will do whatever I can for him, uh, I think he may wind up doing a little better job on that. I know Reince tried, I talked to him, he tried, and he did a lot of good, but um, in, in that regard, we may look back. You know, two years from now, and say the day General Kelly took over was a good day for America and a good day for the Trump administration. Yes. Hi, um, I know you're in an education uh, committee. We have an education secretary who calls public education a dead end. Those are who are her words. And I wonder if you agree with that. We have people in this room who um, are intimately involved in some very successful public schools. My daughter just graduated from Alcart, Summa Cum Laude. She would not agree it's a dead end. I don't think we can afford to fund private voucher schools along with public education. So are they dead ends? Uh, no, I don't know in which context she said that. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to having her come before the education committee so I can ask her some questions. Um, I do not like increased federal role in education, and I made that clear to her when we met in formal meeting. Um, last year, in a mild success, we passed something called the uh, Student Success Act, which I think just about every local superintendent is happy with because of these it's less federal paperwork, less federal involvement in education. Um, some of us are a little disappointed in that we feel she hasn't done all she would with that act to reduce federal involvement in education. Um, and you know, my mom was a teacher. Um, I went to public schools. You can tell me afterwards whether you think I turned out okay or not. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think public education is a dead end. Congressman, I'd like to thank you for many of the projects that you championed to help the city out with some of the things we're trying to do. Uh, specifically, the Mall Marine Sanctuary, we appreciate you signing on to the congressional letter to support the designation of Sanctuary off the coast of Sheboygan, Manitowoc, Port Washington, Two Rivers, and Mequon. Also, uh, our community block grant funds are in jeopardy, which President Trump trying to eliminate those. And uh, you know, that brings about $750,000 a year to the city to help with our neighborhood revitalization programs. And uh, we just appreciate you fighting to at least keep it to a modest decrease rather than eliminating that program. And then there's also the GLRI funding. Uh, the city and the county did a project uh, with along with EPA and other federal agencies in the state to clean up the Sheboygan River. And we drew down $58 million worth of that GLRI funding to accomplish that project. There's smaller projects that we're still able to uh, use that funding for. But more importantly, many other communities need to clean up their uh, EPA uh, Superfund sites and area of concern, and, and those need to be funded as well. So thank you for all your efforts. Well, you know, I was supportive of bringing back the Great Lakes initiative. It looks like we're going to be 
a successful player. Um, I agree with you, we could have had a small cut on uh, community block grants. I don't even know you're going to get a small cut. And I'll just be honest, you know, we're so broke. I think there should be small cuts all over the place, so we're never going to, you know, get where we have to get. But it, it, it's apparent that, you know, you're not going to have a big cut down the front line. I think what happened in some of these 100% cuts in this budget, he's a new president, and he's got to slap together a budget in two months, and maybe some of them were a little bit not as thought out as they should be. But on the other hand, there are other programs that could have been cut a little bit more. So I'm conscious of those, and we'll look out for them. And I, you know, that I think I was in part instrumental in the budget. Just talking about cost cutters, budget and cost cuts, where do you see two or three of the most critical areas where you can get real impact? Um, I don't believe that we should cut welfare just to save money. But it is clear as you look at the budget and you look for big dollar figures, our transfer payments, uh, means-based transfer payments are great. We have to make sure we don't hurt the people who are genuinely vulnerable or can't fend for themselves. But there is a certain amount of evidence out there that you will find if you just talk to people in this room after you leave. Uh, there are people who are, you can see them falling into a trap, because I don't think it's much of a lifestyle, so it's what I call a welfare lifestyle. I think there is the ability there to have, to have substantial reductions. It's a big dollar figure. And when you're borrowing like 13% I think the bureaucracies could also be looked at in the end. I always vote to try to have cuts there. And I think on the military, we are not going to have, we shouldn't be going up by 90% of the military. By the way, they're even more irritating on that military thing. They're going to do a complete audit now for the first time in a while. Before you have that big upper, we should do the audit first. OK. Anybody else? Come on. What time is it? Um, oh, oh, let's see. Okay. This is you may not have too much detail to say, but you know, yeah. so Fox Con obviously is pretty big. Should we have a pretty rapid transition? But hopefully, something will start to be seen in the Fox Con. Yeah, I think one thing that I didn't used to realize, somebody else from the book, everybody knows that, I didn't realize the degree to which. When you produce a finished product, the huge number of jobs at the facilities that give the parts and supplies or whatever to the, to the final manufacturer. Like when you talk about coal or company or mercury and green, final lag or something, you talk about the jobs in those facilities, but there's another four or five jobs in, in other manufacturing facilities that provide for the people who put together the final product. And Given the huge amount of manufacturing we have around here, I'd be shocked if there were a lot of jobs in the place. Come on, somebody, think of something. Ask me for my favorite color. Ask me what type of dog I buy. What else can I say? Sure, I'll ask you something along those lines. If you could visit any country for an extended time period, where would you go? Um, I guess there are two that come to mind. Um, in this job, congressmen get to go abroad a lot. And uh, I didn't go abroad the first two years because I think they go abroad too much. But I talked to a lot of my colleagues who did almost all go abroad, and they felt the trip they liked the best was Israel. So I will be going to Israel. Um, I also kind of want to go to China because it's so significant for the future of the world. And I think it's important to have good relations with China. And I guess the more congressmen we have going over there, emphasizing we have a good relationship with China, the better. So um, sometimes we'll have to go to China, so we'll search for All right, if you need some lessons, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> Thank you much. Always enjoyable. <laughs>